other people. Yeah. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, so here's the gearbox once again needing to be cleaned. To clean this, I use three chemicals, mineral spirits, arrow magnolia, and brake parts cleaner. I did a fairly decent job of getting a lot of the grime off the GM45714, which, as you can see, has over 30 years of oil and grime uh, all caked upon it. I knew this would be super messy, so I had to put down lots of painter's plastic to help contain all the mess. This was quite a workout, flipping the gearbox over, uh, moving it around to clean it. These are kind of heavy and requires you to have steady hands if you're working on a small surface. Um, after cleaning the box, I removed the drives to replace the o-ring seals and I also had the rear diff cover off to get a good look inside the differential. Um, I was looking for shavings, you know, pieces of metal, anything that looked as if it didn't belong in the box. But it was actually very clean to my surprise. A word of caution when taking the drives out, be aware that the differential for this transmission is suspended via the drives and will fall out of place if both the drives are removed simultaneously. For a gearbox that I assume is original, uh, with 276,000 plus miles on the clock, uh, the center pinion gear and bearing look to be in good working order. Um, all good signs. Next, I took off the transfer case cover to take a look at the chain tensioner. Uh, I was surely expecting to see disaster, but it looked surprisingly normal. The grooves in the tensioner pads were at a minimum and still in good shape. Also, I didn't find any foreign material or broken parts inside the chain case, so this was a good sign. When I drained the gearbox, the fluid was a very dark red color, so either it was GM Synchro Mesh or Honda Manual Transmission Fluid. It definitely smelled like Synchro Mesh and nothing like conventional gear oil. Take a look at fifth gear here you can see the condition of the gears inside. Looking at the condition of the teeth, you can see this gearbox had mostly normal driving and likely saw very little harsh shift patterns. So this could be a tip for those of you who are Saab fans. Um, for example, you may need a gearbox and getting gearboxes uh, from uh, non-turbo cars could be uh, maybe beneficial and land you a gearbox that is in much fairer shape than say one that had a lot of abuse from someone that had a turbo car and maybe a lead foot. It's not a guarantee, but you know, a good step in the right direction. Here's a look at the famous reverse idler gear. Now if you know Saabs, the reverse idler gear is notorious for having some wear issues due to the drivers not allowing the vehicles to stop completely before selecting reverse. And this is due to uh, Saabs not having synchros on the reverse gear, if you know that. But uh, it's still not in bad shape. From here it looks normal. Uh, but when you get a close-up look at the gear here, you can see a slight amount of wear on the edge of the gear. You would normally see the gear's edge worn nearly completely out and chipped away. The wear is there, but it's at a minimum. Once I cleaned the box and inspected the gears, it was time to change the seals on the access panels. You can get brand new seals from Scandix. These will set you back about $75 plus shipping. You can see here the oil sump portion of the box. A big difference from before, even though I wasn't able to get it perfect, but perfection was, really wasn't the goal here. This is the input shaft seal for the transfer case. I was told these leak frequently and they are the most common for the transaxle oil leaks. There are specialty drivers uh, made to install these. If you don't have them, a appropriately sized socket will suffice. This is the gear selector shaft seal. These are also notorious for springing leaks as well. Another thing these are famous for is removing them and then they break in half. In this picture, it looks as if the whole seal came out, but it's actually snapped in half. I went on to install a new one, only to find out there was a remaining metal sleeve jammed inside. Needless to say, it damaged the new seal, and that metal sleeve is part of the old seal, and must be removed before installing the new one. This mistake cost me $15 and another Saturday. So here's the gearbox after it was all cleaned up. Because I painted the block aluminum color, I was really tempted to throw some aluminum paint on the gearbox but ultimately decided against it. One of the things uh, I could have done is replace the rear differential cover with one from Jordan Pagano's modern classic Saab. The high strength rear diff cover is one of the mods that will help strengthen the box to withstand high torque of a high compression turbo setup so I'll hold off on that until the box is torn down for a complete rebuild and equipped with high strength parts. Next, it was time to assemble the engine block. I had already placed the main bearings into the block so that it could receive the crankshaft. 
I use this green Lucas engine assembly loop. This stuff is very slippery and sticky as you can see, but it does an excellent job of protecting the engine during assembly when rotating the crankshaft and priming the uh, engine when before starting when there's very little oil circulation. I then put the main caps on and ran down the bolts and torqued them down. This was kind of difficult because the shop didn't have a regular engine stand, only BMW specific ones were available. Needless to say, these don't fit the Saab engine so I had to do this on the hydraulic table cart. I had to brace the block and keep it from rotating which was very annoying. Once the mains were torqued and secured, a rotation test was in order to ensure the crank would rotate freely without any binding or undesirable anomalies which would allow me to go ahead and install the pistons. It is important to follow the instructions and clock the rings on the pistons to the correct positions before placing the assembly into the ring compressor. Once in place and the rings have been compressed and oiled, install the assembly into the cylinder. Use a hammer to tap the piston into place. Before you do this, ensure the piston assembly is oiled and the crank pin is aligned with the connecting rod. Other Here I'm torquing down the last connecting rods after installing all the pistons. Afterwards another rotating test is necessary to ensure freedom of movement because the pistons are making some contact with the cylinders times four a bit more force is required to turn the assembly because of the friction. But it does turn freely. Once the rotating assembly was installed, I moved on to install the end plates. If you're watching this video and you do need gaskets for your Saab, for the end plates, RBM Saab Parts of France is still manufacturing these and can get these for you. In this bag of seals, you'll find end plate gaskets, oil pan gaskets, radio seals, and a bunch more. Basically everything you'll need to reseal the lower portion of the engine. Once the end plates were on, I added the water pump, oil pump, and oil filter housing and added a spin-on Molly brand oil filter. Of course, before doing that, I installed a brand new timing chain and both guide rails. The large white guide rail can be sourced from Scandix of Germany. The small one can be bought from E-Euro parts. Once all these were in place, I installed the oil pickup tube with a new O-ring. When installing the oil pickup tube, be sure the tube sits all the way inside and lube the seal with some motor oil or a suitable lubricant. I had to hang the engine in order to complete this task. Before sitting the block atop the gearbox, I applied a sealant to the top and bottom of the gasket. Now Saab's repair manual wants you to use Loctite 518 anaerobic gasket maker. I decided to do things a little bit different. After all, testing to see what works is a science. Instead, I wanted to try Permatex Ultra Gray Sealant. I use this to reseal lots of cars that feature iron to aluminum surfaces with no issues. It is equivalent to the Honda Bond and Ranizil, a silicone sealer used in a lot of cars like Mercedes. 
Uh, I think I may be the first to try this on a Saab, uh, so I'm willing to give it a shot. Other After the application of sealer, I then lifted the block assembly and placed it on top of the gearbox, with a helping hand from a laboring technician of course. Next came the cylinder head. Unfortunately, I don't have any footage of me timing the engine uh, as well as putting the cylinder head on as time was short and camera battery life was dwindling. So I filled it in with pictures. Uh, before I move on, I'd like to show you the block plate that I purchased from Modern Classic Saab. Uh, in the package, they included some strange uh, Swedish gummies um, called Swedish fish. Uh, they taste great, but they sure will cling to your teeth. I also purchased two aluminum alternator bushings. In the previous parts of the video, you could see the plate installed on the block. Uh, here is a close-up of the block plate installed. From here, the process was adding the intake manifold, injectors, crank pulleys, and accessories such as the power steering pump. A uh, new idler pulley for the AC compressor and belts. Here are the aluminum bushings for the alternator arm. These help keep the arm and the alternator stationary. And from this point, the engine is actually ready to drop in, so I want to touch on some findings. This was something I was looking for, uh, you know, some extra clues as to other causes for the failed rod bearings. It was a combination of things, lack of timely oil changes as well as low oil pressure. All true, but there is something else. I think it came across a major contributor for the engine failure, and after seeing this, it certainly made sense as to why all the rest of the bearings in the engine had taken a beating. Take a look at this. This is the pressure relief valve inside the oil pump. Inside there's a piston that slides back and forth inside the bore. Uh, the piston moves back and forth against the spring. This piston spring combo controls oil pressure inside the engine. When I removed the 17 mm screw cover and attempted to remove the piston, I found it was frozen into place. A considerable amount of force was necessary to free the piston. Once it was freed, the bore was very dirty with oxidized oil and gunk. This is how it looked after it was cleaned up a bit, before it was barely able to be identified because of the garbage that was on it. It was mandatory that this valve was to be cleaned. After a bath in Arrow Magnolia, I used my Dremel with a 320 grit buffing roll and I cleaned the valve as well as the spring. Here's what the two look like after being cleaned. Note the small holes in the top of the piston. This allows some oil to bypass the piston to help control oil pressure. The next thing that needs to be cleaned is the bore. Now I filmed this on my cell phone, uh, so the footage is a bit shaky and at times out of focus, uh, but it does come into focus. You'll get the idea. I looked inside and I didn't see any scarring, but it definitely was very dirty. To clean it, I used some Arrow Magnolia with uh, the same buffing roll and cleaned up the bore. This is what it should look like after being cleaned. It is clear that the bore has to be very smooth and well oiled in order for the valve to work properly. Here I lightly oiled the bore and used a magnet attached to the piston to demonstrate the proper movement inside of the bore. Freedom of movement of this simple device is essential for oil pressure control. After seeing how this works and seeing the state it was in when it was opened, I have no doubts that this was a major contributor to the accelerated wear on all of the engine's bearings. This is what lack of oil changes would do to your engine. 
All engines have a system set up that is very similar to this built into the oil pump. It shows the importance of keeping the lubrication system clean with fresh oil. While the engine was out of the car, I decided to remove the steering rack uh, in order to tidy it up a little bit. With the engine out, it makes it a lot easier to access and remove the rack. The rack was very dirty and the tie rods were loose and wobbly and needed replacements. I took it to the parts washer and washed off 30 years of oil, dirt and grime. Once all the dirt was removed, I installed new inner tie rods, boots and outer tie rods. Initially, I was going to completely disassemble the rack and install a reseal kit, but I noticed the oily mess on the rack came from the front crank seal and the oil pump seal, not the rack, so I left it alone. It will be removed again and will get a complete reseal at a later date. In the previous video, I mentioned a performance question I saw in the Saab forums, and that question was, why Saab engines don't like to rev? Well, part of the answer to that is that the internal rotating components inside the 900 engines are very heavy. One look at these connecting rods and one can easily come to the conclusion that Saab's engineers had durability in mind when building these, not performance. You saw what the rod looked like in comparison to the protege rod. Now let's take a look at the weights of these rods. One Saab connecting rod weighs a porky 839 grams. That's 1.84 pounds, nearly 2 pounds. The Protégé connecting rod weighs 512 grams, or just over a pound, at 1.12 pounds. The heavier the rotating assembly, the less responsive the engine is going to be. I cannot confirm an exact weight, but picking up the 900 crankshaft feels like it weighs 65 to 75 pounds, or possibly more. It is not lightweight, at all. I can guarantee you there is a significant loss of power when exchanging combustion energy into mechanical force because of Saab's heavy engine internals. There are other reasons, but we'll touch on that later in the high performance build sections of the V212 engine. Okay guys, now that the engine is all assembled, it is being dropped in the engine bay. On the next video, we'll perform the prime procedure, install the spark plugs, and hopefully hear the V212 start for the first time in months. I'd like to say to all my viewers, thank you for watching. If you're new to the channel and you like what you see, go ahead and click that like and subscribe button and more videos will appear. Thanks again and we'll see you next time.